Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Minji Chen. I'm a assistant professor of electrical engineering uh, at Princeton University. Uh, and today it's my pleasure to host our second webinar for the IEEE PALS um, Magnet Challenge. Uh, so we're trying to develop an upgraded model to replace the state statement equation uh, for magnetic core loss modeling. Uh, so today, uh, the main focus today is really trying to give you an update uh, about the current status uh, of the competition, uh, and also to answer any questions that you may you may have because this is the first meeting after we we start the registration process. Uh, our registration will complete in three days, um, May fifteenth. So if there are still uh, teams that may have interested in joining, uh, they can still join. And as we said, we'll try to accommodate uh, as many teams uh, as possible. Uh, and also after our discussion, after we clarify the question, there will be a technical discussion um, around how do we use equation-based based method uh, for making for loss modeling uh, given by Dr. Thomas Quillard uh, of Dartmouth College. Um, so uh, that will be the main uh, agenda of today's meeting. Uh, so I, I hope to ask everyone to mute yourself for now because we do have a lot of participants. Um, so there are about like 200 people registered for this uh, meeting. Uh, so we don't want to create too much noise, but we do have uh, slots of uh, time for discussion where everyone can unmute yourself and we can really, really do this bi-directional uh, interaction. I do hope that uh, we run this meeting as a discussion uh, so that we can all share the information and really, really know each other and create a create a community together. So let me give you a quick update of the uh, challenge as it as 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 of now. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let me do it in the right way. Uh, so uh, since our last meeting, we have switched our main information hub from like a web page we hosted in our group website. Now it's on GitHub. Uh, so we, we really try to run our community as a regular GitHub community and everything can happen online uh, with shared codes and uh, shared uh, an open discussion. So if you go to github.minjichan.magnetchallenge, um, this link will be provided after the meeting and it's also, you can find it from, uh, from the emails that we send it to everyone. Uh, so uh, this is a regular, typical GitHub uh, repository, uh, and you can see the information. This website now provides the latest information uh, about the Magnet Challenge. We'll, we'll post everything uh, here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. You can send it to our personal emails or uh, through the pelsmagnet.gmail.com. Uh, regarding timeline, uh, we announced the Magnet Challenge uh, around February, uh, and here there's a Magnet Challenge handbook which provides detailed information about why do we organize this competition and what's the, what are the goals and the basic rules uh, of the competition. Uh, we also posted a data quality report. Uh, so every data uh, is not 100% perfect. And we do expect that there are outliers uh, or errors in our data, but statistically our data should be uh, with roughly uniform quality across different materials. But feel free to let us know if you find any issues or if you have any question about the data uh, uh, and about the data quality. Um, so the data is now available uh, in Dropbox, so you can go and click this link and you can download the available data for 10 materials, uh, which you can use it to uh, develop your algorithms uh, and program your software. Um, and hopefully when, when in the future, when there are new data coming in, you can quickly develop new models for a new, a new data uh, and for a new material. Uh, so the one page letter of intent uh, deal with signature, uh, it will be due in three days. Um, so next Monday, I believe. Um, so if you still have friends uh, or colleagues who are interested in participating in the Magnet Challenge, um, you're welcome to submit. And we probably can be a, a little bit more flexible. Even after this, we can, because this is a software competition and we're happy to host as many teams as possible. Um, so, uh, the, there are two page concept paper due, uh, proposal due. Uh, this is the important part for 
uh, the teams who has uh, uh, has registered. So there's one more item that will be due. Um, so we just want to make sure everyone understands uh, what we're doing, uh, understand the general rule. Uh, so the purpose of this concept paper is not trying to filter teams. So as long as you submit something that makes sense, uh, will you'll be accepted. So the real purpose is just trying to make sure uh, your team has the background and has the knowledge about what we're doing. So you could simply write, what do you plan to do uh, in this competition? You can say, uh, we, are, we are proposing to develop a data-driven model, uh, develop an equation-based model, or even simply looking to the data or maybe develop an algorithm which can quickly clarify or identify the outliers in the data. So it could be anything related to a core loss modeling. Um, and as we said, there are different tracks. We have a performance track where we are competing uh, on model accuracy. Uh, and we have a novelty track which, where we are mainly competing for model novelty. So any new ideas or new uh, new thoughts uh, in this general field will be will be considered and, and we welcome uh, new ideas. Uh, so around uh, July 1st, we will, you will have a notification of acceptance. We'll basically check the uh, concept paper and making sure uh, every team is eligible and understanding the rules. Um, we don't want teams who is like on our list. We, we try to make sure we can provide support to all the participating teams. So we want to make sure all the teams on our list are, are actively thinking about it. Uh, so, and then between uh, July and November will be will be sort of like a, a quiet period. Uh, every teams you can, based on the team materials or the database, we give it to you. You can do whatever you want. Uh, and develop basically what we need is in the end give us 10 models describing that 10 material. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you have a software pipeline in your end so that when new data is provided to you, uh, you can quickly generate new models. So hopefully this is a semi-automated or fully automated process. Uh, so when you have the uh, 10 materials, you can uh, fit it into a software code. It will output with the software will be a model. And when the new data comes in, you can quickly also generate new models. Of course, you can do tuning uh, afterwards. So, so basically around November 1st, what we need from you is 10 models uh, for the 10 material and also a brief discussion uh, I believe it's like a five page or three page or five page documents uh, describing what you have done and, and what's your software pipeline in processing the data. Of course, this is not a final competition. This is just trying to, it's a milestone to make sure uh, uh, we are on the same page. Uh, and then around November 1st, we will release three new data space for three new material. Uh, where you are requested to quickly develop a new model, the model for the three materials, the three new material which your model has never seen. Uh, and then the competition results will be, uh, and this result will be due around uh, December 24, so end of the year. So you will need to submit the new model for the three new materials. Um, so this time you need to submit the model so that we can also run our test uh, behind the scene. So we do have private data, which we never give it to you. So we'll give you a part of the data for the three ma new materials. And there will be another part of the data which we don't release. And we'll use the accuracy on the data that we didn't release um, as, a, as, a, as a benchmark to compare different models and evaluate who is the final winner. And hopefully, uh, if everything goes smoothly, we'll try to wrap up the competition before uh, March next year and hopefully announce the winner uh, around APAC um, for next year. So uh, uh, that's sort of uh, about the timeline. Um, I'll, I'll finish everything and then we'll open up for like five minutes question uh, period. Um, so uh, basically, there are three evaluations that will happen uh, throughout the competition. Uh, around uh, June 15, that's the two-page concept proposal. We'll just quickly glance through your idea and make sure that uh, all the teams understand the rules. And, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer any, any of these. Uh, and around November 1st, we'll be evaluating the 10 models that you develop for the 10 material uh, and provide feedback if we have any. Uh, and finally, uh, around end of the year, we'll evaluate the three new models that you develop for the three new material that we give it to you uh, at, in, 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 in November. 
Uh, so criteria. So uh, we don't have a firm criteria because in the end, the judging committee, uh, which comprises experts uh, in the field, will have the final voice. But roughly, we care about the following uh, a few aspects. One is model accuracy. Of course, we want a model which can relatively accurately predicting uh, the, 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 the collage. And here, because uh, every measurement has errors, so we'll take our data as a ground truth where which we know our data is not necessarily the ground truth there's always error in there uh, but be, because this competition we're not competing on measurement equipment or measurement capabilities we will assume that the data we provided is the real world data where maybe provided by a manufacturer or provided for any material so you don't need to really worry about the physical side of the thing but thinking of the data as what you get from a manufacturer and it could be outliers maybe 90% of the data is pretty accurate and there are 10% of the data is less accurate, which is very possible because for core loss at very low loss and very high loss at high frequency, low frequency, you have different error margins. So which is a real world scenario. So just take our data as a real world data with reasonable uh, uh, error uh, with maybe 5% to 10% error within the data. Uh, but in the end, we'll be evaluating our accuracy in a statistical way. So the accuracy right now, what we said is we'll evaluate your core loss accuracy as 95 percentage error. So meaning that uh, there's a percentage error, so 95 percent of the chance your prediction is within this error range. So that's how we, we de describe model accuracy. Uh, there's also model size. So in the end, we hope that we can make the model as small as possible. Uh, because well, model is trying to help us to understand the physical world, and human brain is not designed to produce, uh, process a huge amount of information. So it's better in order to understand the physics. It's better if we can describe the same physical phenomenon with a fewer number of parameters. So what we will say is that well, given the same accuracy, um, or if we're comparing models, of course accuracy is very very important. But model size is also very important. We are looking for models that are smaller, uh, but at the same time can achieve reasonably good accuracy. Uh, so if you go with equation-based method, which is the focus of today's technical talk, uh, of course, you probably have a higher chance in winning in terms of model size because your model will be smaller. Uh, and uh, if you go with a neural network approach, then you should pay, really pay efforts in trying to find the smallest neural network can, that can describe the behavior. And we don't know where they are, and and what we don't know where the right trade-offs are, and we're looking for student teams that can really make the right trade-off between model complexity uh, and the model accuracy. And finally, we are looking for some model explainability. We hope that the model can be reasonably explained, and of course, equation-based model usually you can explain it better, uh, and data-driven model usually the explainability is a little bit worse. So uh, we are looking for teams that can tell us where is the good. Uh, trade off between the two. Uh, and finally, we're looking for novelty. So, a new understanding of biodomain and core loss, new understanding about physics. We definitely welcome those. Uh, and finally, uh, for software quality, we hope that because in the end, we'll do a code check, especially for the winning teams, uh, who is we are considering for the winners. We, we, we do look for codes that are explainable and readable so that everyone else can really understand what's happening and we can verify. And, and really understand the applicability and limitations uh, of the code and hopefully improve it as a community. So this is the general uh, evaluation criteria. Uh, as we said, we'll, we'll have answer, happy to answer any questions you may have uh, later. Um, so for recording, uh, so we have organized four webinars and probably we'll have more webinars later on. So this week is, uh, we have our kickoff meeting uh, one month ago, and we have uh, today's equation-based methods. Uh, next week, Haoran will be talking about machine learning-based methods. Uh, and finally, around uh, uh, end of May, we'll talk about data complexity and data quality. Uh, as I said, we want to run this as an open, transparent a community effort. So if you have anything you want to share with the community, uh, and organize a webinar, let us know and we'll make it happen. So we'll, we'll try to sort of keep everyone engaged uh, throughout this process and make sure we learn. I think it's the most important things, not necessarily what we get in the end, but really this process uh, and really trying to push uh, our understanding about power magnetics to the next level as a community. 
So let us know if you have any interesting insights or if you want us to help you organize a webinar, we'll be very happy to do that. And I'm sure Pels will be happy to do that. So, uh, and on, on the other hand, we'll record all of the webinars. So if you have to miss any of the webinar, uh, don't worry, you can watch the, watch the video recordings uh, after the webinar. Uh, so following a recommendation from Professor Jagan Masmovich uh, a few weeks ago, we need a forum, open forum, because student teams may ask the same question. So we do, the, the, fortunately, the GitHub has built-in uh, discussion function. So if you go to the GitHub repository, you go to discussions, then there are questions that has been raised. Uh, we have received emails uh, from student teams. So if you have any question, maybe the, 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 the most efficient uh, uh, strategies just come to this uh, GitHub repository and look at the Q&A and see if anyone else have asked the same question. And we'll try to answer the question. As I said, uh, the rules may change. Uh, we are also learning. This is the first time we're organizing this challenge. Uh, so feel free to let us know if you have any recommendation in terms of how do we evaluate the models and how do we com compete and how do we release the data, how do we organize the data about data quality. So anything, think about even our organizers as, as uh, participating in the competition uh, together with yourself. And, and we, we welcome all kinds of feedbacks uh, from the student teams because we can make it or include it in next year. Even if we can't change it this year, we'll, we'll probably change it for next year. Um, so uh, in terms of awards, we have again, model performance award, uh, model performance award, first place, second place, model novelty award, first place, second place, outstanding software engineering award and uh, multiple honorable mention. Um, in terms of teams, uh, right now we have 38 teams uh, from 18 countries. I just counted uh, this morning and probably we'll have a few more teams. For, I, I'm optimistic that we'll have more than 40 teams and probably hopefully from like more than 20 countries. Uh, so these are the university lists. So if you have registered, but your university name is not listed here, let me know, uh, let us know and we'll make sure we, 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 we put all the university uh, names here and, and countries here. I feel like this really show that we are a international energetic uh, community and working together to tackle a very uh, interesting problem. So with this, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, we have about seven minutes, six minutes, seven minutes. Uh, so I'll open the floor up and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, is, there a, is there a uh, constraint on like excitation waveform? Um, I checked the, uh, the B field and H field um, data set provided from um, the website. And um, in some cases, they specify like what kind of uh, waveform that we are using. But sometimes I don't, it wasn't very clear to me like if it's this a sinusoid or trapezoidal or some kind of arbitrary waveform. Uh, um, can you please clarify that part, please? Right. So, uh, so we 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 have right now in the database we don't really differentiate. Uh, we don't tag the data. So we we do have sine wave, triangle wave, and trapezoidal wave. Um, and we within the this year we don't think we will have other type of waveforms. So in general, it will be these three type of waveforms, and they are already a huge amount of combinations. Uh, for due to ratio and frequency and amplitude and temperature. So, so in terms of, to answer your question, uh, the data will include this generally these three type of waveforms with different temperature and frequency and amplitudes. Uh, but for, for the 10 materials, it's a mix of all of them and you are welcome to develop a classification. You can develop an algorithm, first do the classification of the waveform and then do the prediction. Or you can just do a sequence to sequence recognition uh, where you don't care what type of waveform is coming in. Um, because when you're talking about the VDT and the transient speed, then there are infinite number of ways you can even define it. Um, so for the final evaluation, it will be the same. We, we will not have a new type of waveform coming in for the testing data. 
So you'll be what we are doing is basically we're measuring the data for the three new material and we we'll randomly partition them into two categories. One is we will give it to you and the other will give it to us, but uh, it's uniformly distributed across the three type of waveforms. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so basically for the testing, the, 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 the data will be used, used to test your model will be very similar to the data we give it to you, uh, but at different operating conditions, of course. Any other question? If not, then I'll pass the uh, stage to Dr. Thomas Quiller. We'll be giving us a technical discussion uh, presentation on uh, the equation-based modeling of magnetic for Okay. Um, welcome to this webinar. I am Thomas. I'm a researcher at Dartmouth College. And here I will talk about equation-based model which are a certain class of model for magnetic material. And I will a bit first introduce why we are doing that, which kind of model we have, and how you can start with implementing new models. We all know magnetics they are bottlenecks, they are bulky, they're expensive. And a lot of that is coming to the fact that actually we don't really know the soft magnetic material themselves. The data sheet, they are extremely inaccurate. They are also on, only sinusoidal data. On the model, we have a lot of models that can have 100% deviation between the predicted and the measured losses. On that, you will see when you will start to develop model, getting wrong by a factor of two is very common. And this all comes to the fact that we don't have first principles models. So we don't have a simple set of equations, like the Maxwell's equation, describing the behavior of magnetic material. So this is all basically the goal of this magnet challenge, which is all we can find better models. And why it is so difficult? The thing is, everything is nonlinear with respect to amplitude, wave shape, frequency. Here we can see that when we change the temperature, the hysteresis loop is narrowing. When we change the frequency, increasing the frequency, the hysteresis loop is widening. And when we are going to triangular or trapezoidal waveform, then the loop starts to have very strange shapes. So this is clearly not something so simple to get a model that is predicting the losses, so the area under the hysteresis loop. And this is basically what brings us to the magnet challenge, where this is based on this magnet data set. As Minche just um, said, this is based on these 10 different materials. There is thousands of measurements. And then the goal of the challenge is to develop innovative models, something that is accurate, but also something that is usable. The goal at the end of the day, we are engineers. We want some things that we can use to develop components and systems. And there is two main class of models. If you have another idea which doesn't fit into these two class, you are very welcome to also do it. But the two main class is data-driven model, which is machine learning. It can be neural network, but also some other kind of machine learning on equation-based model, which are based on more simple analytical equations. So I will divide this talk in three different parts. First, I will give you an overview about the equation-based model. Then I will a bit give you what are the advantage of equation-based model against machine learning in order to give you some pointer in which direction you might want to go. And at the end, if we have a bit more time, I will give you an example of an implementation of an equation-based model. But if we don't have time, um, the code is also on GitHub. So you can also check it by yourself. So what are equation-based models? There are different kinds of models. And basically, we are always at this trade-off between accuracy and how flexible the model is or the complexity. But we can see all the models that have been published until now, they kind of follow a trend. If you want to get more accurate, you have to add complexity. For example, the IGSC model, which is one of the very common equation-based models, only has three parameters. A neural network model can have up to 50,000 parameters. So we have really to be careful when we are comparing the model that we are not comparing apple to orange. And the goal, of course, is to get a model that is very accurate and very simple, which is probably impossible because the material are not very simple. So the question is a bit where you want to lie 
on this trade off. And this is something as a team, you can decide that you want something extremely simple that can be used very easy by design engineer, or you want to aim for the most accurate model somewhere here. And this is really something that you have a bit to choose. Or we can define equation bond based model. It's a model that has based on the analytical formulation, so some equation. This equation can be fully empirical, not linked to any kind of physics, or they can be physics inspired. That we know, for example, that between this parameter and this one, it should be an exponential dependency. So we put an exponential um, equation between these parameters. But we still need some of the parameters of this equation, they are empirical. We need to fit them, to parameterize them with measurements. So they are equation based, but they are still needing measurement to be parameterized. On the simplest, on the oldest um, model is the Steinmetz equation, which has been introduced more than 130 years ago, originally, originally without frequency dependency, but this is the modern form of the Steinmetz equation, which says that the losses are of constant K times the frequency to the power of alpha times the flux density to the power of beta. On this parameter K alpha and beta, they are typically fitted with sinusoidal measurement, but you could also fit with something else. But the main problem of this model is we don't have a dependency on the wave shape. Here, we don't have any information. Do we have a sinus, a triangular, a trapezoidal? And this is one of the main limitation of this equation. 20 years ago in Dartmouth, the IGSC, the Improved Generalized Steinmetz Equation has been introduced, which is solving this issue that this can be applied to arbitrary waveform. This is also based on the Steinmetz uh, parameters k, alpha, and beta, but now we have an equation that is an integral, which is valid for any kind of wave shape, which says that basically the losses are proportional to the derivative of the flux density to the power of alpha on the peak flux density to the power of beta minus alpha. And this is a typical equation-based model, and this probably is the one that is currently used the most um, for designing magnetics. But we have also some modern mod uh, models, for example, this one introduced um, from uh, Germany some years ago, which are based then not on the derivative, but on the second derivative of the flux density. So there is here two models, this one, which has only three parameters, very similar also to Steinmetz parameters, on this one with more parameters, which basically says that the losses are the static energy, so the energy for the static hysteresis loop at low frequency, time an effective frequency, which is the frequency multiplied by a correction factor that depend on the second derivative. And here we can basically say it like, yes, this model are nice, but all as a team, should you develop new models? Or are you coming to such an equation and saying, this is what I want to try as a model? And now I will give you for another model a bit the development and all you can come to such a model. So the first thing I want to introduce is something called the composite waveform hypothesis. Oh, this is an hypothesis. This is not completely correct, but it is still very useful to think about um, magnetic losses. So it basically says that the waveform can be decomposed in several segments, and then we can compute the losses of each segment separately. And for the analytical equation, a lot of the method rely sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, of this hypothesis to be correct. Um, what does it mean? If we have an input signal, for example, here, asymmetric triangular signal, we can take the rise, the rising edge, and define a symmetric signal that has the same rising edge. And then we do the same for the falling edge. We get the same symmetric signal with the equivalent falling edge. And then we can have the losses of this signal or the losses of this signal. And we can basically say that approximately the losses of the asymmetric signal is the sum of the losses of these two signals. And this is something that is quite intuitive. It is not perfect, but it is also quite accurate. Then the question is, oh, you can apply that to arbitrary waveform. For triangular signals, this decomposition is quite intuitive, but then all you could apply that for arbitrary waveform. And what you can do is introduce a 
local equivalent frequency, which is a frequency that is defined for each point in time of your signal and is proportional to the derivative of the flux density. And if you have a symmetric triangular signal, the blue signal, the equivalent frequency is constant and equal to the frequency of the signal because the slope here is always the same. But when you get a signal that has a fast transient on a slow transient, you get a high equivalent frequency for the fast transient on a low one for the slow transient. And then you can basically define that for every kind of signal, which is basically telling you how fast the magnetization is changing, which is important for the losses because fast transient a lossy transient for magnetic material. If you change the flux very quickly, you will make quite some losses. And then once we have that, we can apply the composite waveform hypothesis. So this is what is leading us to this IGCC model, which is called, sorry, the improved generalized composite calculation. And then this model says that for any signal, we can compute this local equivalent frequency for each point in time. And then we know the losses of the 50% triangular symmetric signal. This is basically where our model is parameterized. It's what we need to know from the data set to parameterize this model. And then the model says that we, you can compute the losses of any arbitrary waveform as the average of the losses for each segment with the equivalent local frequency. And you can see a lot of this equation-based model, they are based on integrals. You could also have other things, for example, the model being based on the solution of a differential equation, but you will very often have integral and derivative in this model. If the signal is piecewise linear, for example, a triangular signal, a trapezoidal signal, of course, the integral can be decomposed into a summation. But then the question is, this model is dependent on knowing the losses of um, symmetric triangular signal. And or we do know that we can just do that with interpolation, or we can do that with curve fitting. And I will just now shortly present these two um, different approach. On a lot of the equation-based model, we have very similar um, way of parameterizing the model. So interpolation, we just take the symmetric triangular waveform at different frequency and flux density. You can get that directly from the magnet data set, and then you interpolate. Advantage is very simple. It is accurate, but of course you need this big data set. This is typically here do, doable by doing the triangulation of all the points, and then you can interpolate here in a log scale and you get the losses for every combination of frequency and flux density. But if you don't have so many data, you don't want to use so many data, you want a simpler model, you can also do curve fitting to predict these losses. And here's, this is, a typical fit, and this is typically something when you develop an equation-based model, you will try different expression until you find an equation that you are satisfied with. In this particular case, for example, we can say that the losses of a symmetric signal are a parameter lambda time b to the power of beta. But know the parameter lambda and beta, they are frequency dependent. They are not like the classical Steinmetz parameter constant, but they are frequency dependent. And we can fit them for different frequency from the data set, and we get this curve from alpha on beta, in uh, from lambda on beta in function of the frequencies. And then we can also simplify this curve with a simple cubic fit. So we have very simple expression on these two curves basically describe what we need for the model. And we can see here, this is quite accurate with accuracy around plus minus 10% for the complete range that is in the magnet data set for the N87 material. So now we have a model and we can see all this model is able to predict the losses for other kinds of waveforms. And here we consider first N87 at 25 degrees and we can see the different models, the IGC, these two models based on the second derivative and this IGCC model that I just introduced. And of course, in black, there are the measurement. And the first thing that we can see when we look at the losses in function of frequencies is that both the IGSC, but also the second derivative model based on three parameters, they are a straight line. And this is basically, if you look at the equation, it has to be like that. 
the model can only describe a straight line in a logarithmic scale between the losses on the frequency. But this is not all ferrite material are behaving. You typically have at low frequency, one asymptote, one slope, or at high frequency, you converge to another one. On this model, I'm not able to deal with that. But if we look at the other model with a second derivative on the IGCC model, they are, for example, able to get this frequency dependency or this change of the slope with the frequency. Another thing when you can check the model is all the losses are changing when we change the duty cycle of a triangular waveform. The losses are always minimal at 50% duty cycle, and they're increasing toward very low or very high duty cycle. Because of course, with a very low or very high duty cycle, the slope is increasing. The transit is getting faster, so we are getting more loss. And we can see that, for example, the IGSC has a tendency to underestimate quite massively the losses in this region of very low or very high duty cycle. And we can see that some of the other models, especially the IGCC, are performing significantly better there. And this is a good starting point. You take a few waveform, and you look at this curve, does this model make at all some sense or not? But then when it starts to look good, you have to check a bit more. And to look at the complete data set, and here this is also from the magnet data set, N87, but then you start to look in a wider range. Different frequencies, flux density, temperature, wave shape, triangular, trapezoidal. And here we are, for example, for this particular um, data set, 4,700 signals. And then you can check your model on all of these signals and see is it performing well or not. And here we can see the measurement at um, 25 degrees. And we see here the histogram comparing the IGSC and the IGCC of the relative error. And we can see, for example, that the IGCC, the error is much more concentrated towards zero, so the accuracy is better. And then you can also basically get the metrics, the average, RMS, 95 percentile, maximum error. On the magnet data set, we will mainly use the 95 percentile error to judge the models, but it's really interesting why you are developing the models to look at all of these different metrics. And for example, here we can see the IGSC, which is a very simple model, has a 16%, 95% error. So IGCC, that is a bit of a more complex model, has 11%, 95% relative error. But this is all at 25 degrees. For example, we can now say in the, for the magnet challenge, we have different temperatures. Uh, we can here see all these different models are behaving at 25, 50, 70, or 90 degrees. And what we can see is sometimes it can be very misleading to just look at a specific part of the data set. For example, here, the 25 degree Celsius temperature. Because here we can see all of these models, oh, sorry, they are pretty good, and especially this violet, um, sorry, the blue model, the second derivative model with three parameters looks at 25 degrees, pretty good. But then when we increase the temperature, this model is completely failing at some point reaching almost 50% error on the 95 percentile. Where, for example, the IGSC parameters is slightly degrading in performance, but is still relatively good everywhere. On the IGCC model is actually keeping very good performance over the complete temperature range. So this is something you have always to be careful when you develop a model. Of course, you start with a few signal, with a small uh, part of the data set, but as long as you didn't check with the complete data set, you cannot really say if the model is really good or not. So this was an overview of some equation-based model. And then the question is, what are the limitations of this model? Or actually, what are the opportunities for you to do something better? on win the magnet challenge. On all the model I showed you here, the IGSC, IGCC, on the second derivative-based model, they are all ignoring what is called relaxation-based, uh, relaxation losses. Relaxation losses means what happens if you keep for some time the flux density constant. So you don't apply any voltage and the flux density remains constant for some time intervals. On this model, they will predict 
that this is not making any losses. Not changing the flux doesn't make losses. But this is not true. These relaxation losses are actually, we do have losses, even if the flux density remains constant. But this is something that is missing in this model. And this is something that you can actually add to get a more accurate model. Something else is this model don't really include explicitly the temperature dependency. You can fit the model at different temperatures, but they don't really predict themselves how the losses will change with temperatures. They also don't include DC bias on the effect of core shape, but this is not relevant for the magnet challenge, at least for this year. We are not considering neither DC bias, neither the effect of core shape. And here are like four references if you want to get started with equation-based model. I didn't want it to put you a huge list of 50 different reference and you are getting completely lost into it. Each of these paper, of course, themselves, they have reference, but these four papers are actually a good place to get started for this model. Then, actually, the question is, should you go more in this direction or should you more go in the direction of machine learning? On each of these models, they have advantage on drawbacks. Of course, all these advantage of drawback are sometimes a bit subjective. So this part is a bit more based on my subjective opinion of the advantage or disadvantage of model, but they can be actually useful insight if you want to choose where you want to start. The first thing is where the equation-based model are shiny. First, the number of parameters. The IGSC only has three parameters, k, alpha, and beta. Most of these equation-based models, they are much below, they are below 30 parameters, where machine learning can have from 500 to tens of thousands of parameters, so being much more complex. Also, the size of the data set that you need to fit or train the model. You can fit the IGSC with only three measurements. But a lot of this equation-based model with a few tens or few hundreds of measurements, you can fit them where machine learning model will typically require a much larger data set to be trained with thousands of points. It is also very easy, as Professor Chen mentioned, to link equation-based model to physical phenomena, to say, I want here a quadratic dependency. I want here a cubic one. I want there a exponential. You can basically look at the physics and see a bit what you want. With machine learning, this is not impossible, but it is much more difficult to implement some particular physics into your model. Also, the ability to debug and interpret your model. Even for equation-based models, this is not that easy. To understand why this model is not working in some case, you need to really look quite deep into it. And even with relatively simple equations, this is not that trivial. But with machine learning, when you have tens of thousands of parameters, this is really a black box. It's very difficult to know what is happening inside. There are still some other advantage of equation-based model is predicting wave shape that you are not training or fitting the model on. For example, the IGSC, you are training with symmetric triangular data or sinusoidal data, but then you can predict arbitrary waveform. With the machine learning, this is also possible, but more unpredictable. It's very difficult to train a machine learning model only with sinusoidal data, and then making predict triangular data. I'm not saying this is impossible, but it is more challenging. And also extrapolation. What happens if you fit or train your model between 50 and 500 kilohertz, but then you want to evaluate the model at 700 kilohertz? For equation-based model, this is risky. You have to be very careful if you start to extrapolate outside the fitting range, but this is possible if you have very careful. For machine learning, this is actually extremely suicidal to try to evaluate a machine learning model in place it has not been trained. On the last advantage of equation model, you have a chance to detect if you have a data set with a problem, a problem with your data set. Because since you are using some physical insight for developing the model, if it is not fitting at all, maybe you will realize that actually the problem is with the data set. Of course, you can have a bad data set or not detect it, but you have a chance you might detect it. For machine learning, it is much more difficult. If you have garbage in, you have also garbage at the output. So here we could see that equation-based model look so much better than machine learning. 
but actually machine learning have also some massive advantage. One, it is extremely flexible. The equation-based models, they can only limit what is a model, what is in the equation. For example, I show you for the IGSC, we have a straight line between losses on frequency in a log log scale. And if the material doesn't respect these behaviors, you are out of luck, it will not work very well. Where the machine learning model are able to self-adapt to a lot of different operating conditions, material behaviors, and so on. Also, another advantage of machine learning is the possibility to extend the model. You want to add DC bias, temperature to the model. And for equation-based model, you need to update the equation. And this can be difficult. You can have a model working very well without DC bias. And then you try to add an additional parameters for modeling the DC bias on kind of the complete model is collapsing. And for machine learning, this is much more easy. You can add parameters as long as it's not a fundamental paradigm shift into the model, it's working very well. Another thing is the accuracy. Equation-based models, they can be quite accurate, but it's always a bit difficult to get accurate in extremely wide range of operating conditions, so wide range of frequency, flux density, temperatures, whereas machine learning model can have extreme accuracy and actually accuracy that are in the same range as the data set, the measurement accuracy from the data set. And uh, last um, drawback of equation-based model, which also a bit reflects the question that has been asked before, is for equation-based model, you will need typically the data to be in a certain form, to be structured, pre-processed, sorted. And this can be actually quite some work to prepare the data set in the form that you need. Whereas machine learning model, you can more directly feed the raw data to the model or the model can directly learn from the raw data, which is much less work. And here, I would like to also give you a few um, pointers on what you should be careful with the magnet data set, especially for equation-based model. First, yes, you will need to pre-process, filter, and sort the data to bring this data in the form that you want to see which signal are sinusoidal, which signal are triangular, which duty cycle to basically sort the data set. Some things that can also be a difficulty, the points are not on a regular grid because of course they are measurement. Here we want to measure the flux density at 350 millitesla, but one point might be 349, one point might be 351, which is not a problem, but you algorithms, the way that you are parameterizing, fitting the model should be able to deal with that. We also have some points that are missing because when you are measuring tens of thousands of points, the measurement will fail for some point. For example, here, this point has been removed because the measurement was not good. So your algorithm should also be able to deal with these kind of things. And the last thing is the range of the data set might not be exactly what you want for some model. For example, for the IGCC model, the magnet data set, the frequency range is not exactly what you would like to parameterize the model. And this is, of course, a limitation that we have this data set, which is common for everyone, but depending which model you are developing, it might be that this data set is not very adapt for that. So you should always be careful to look what is possible with the data set that you have. And another thing that you have to be a bit careful is the frequency range. The data set we are providing to you is between 50 and 500 kilohertz. But if you take, for example, the N27 materials, this material is optimally used in power electronics between 10 and 100 kilohertz, which means that here, the measurement you have available are at very high frequencies compared to the operating range of the material. But if you look at 3F4 materials, this is optimal between 700 and 2 megahertz. 700 kilohertz on two megahertz. So here's the range of measurement is very low compared to the optimal operating range. On this, you have to be careful when you are using, especially models that are physics based, because some of the physical phenomena that you try, uh, the phenomena that you are trying to model, they might not happen in the range that the data are available. 
or when you are trying to model an effect that doesn't happen, the fitting or the parameterization of the model can end up to be quite a disaster. So this is also something you have to be careful is in which range this model, uh, this data set are, and in which range do you need data to parameterize the models. That being said, I will move now to the last part um, of this talk, which is a, really an example of how you can implement an equation-based model. And then the SUS code is on GitHub, which can give you a bit of a starting point of how you can do something like that. The workflow is always very similar. You are starting with the original magnet data set that you can download from the website. And then you will have the processing, filtering, sorting, to basically bring the data set in the form that you need. And here, we, there will be a magnet webinar, which is the fourth one, which will be mostly focused on the data set. So I will not speak too much about that here, but at the end, you are splitting the data set. One part of the data you will use for fitting, training the model. On one part, you will only use to check if the model is good or not. And ideally, you want as little data as possible to fit the model because you want a model that can be parameterized with very few measurements. But this is up to you. And this is also a trade-off with accuracy. The more data you are using for fitting the model, the more accurate typically the model will be. So this is also a trade-off between the complexity and the accuracy that you have to do. Then you are using this fitting data set to parameterize the model and then you are obtaining your loss model. And then you are evaluating the loss model compared to this data set, and at the end, you are checking what are the performance of the model. And basically, every model that you will have for the challenge, but also um, machine learning model, will fundamentally follow this workflow. So here, the example that I will show you, this is a MATLAB implementation, but if you want to use Python, the code will be extremely similar because the two programming languages are not that different. And in this slide, I will only show you very small part of the code for the IGSC, but a more complete code with a full documentation for IGSC, but also the IGCC is on this GitHub repository. So you can download it and really look um, calmly how it is working. Just a few disclaimer. The goal of the code that is provided here is meant to highlight the typical workflow. It's not meant to be the most accurate or complete model that there is. It's also a lot of assumption have been done. It's using a single material at ambient temperature, only triangular signal. The parameterization is quite simple because this is meant as a simple model where you can start on very easily or not something too complex. So if we go, very quickly to the code, I will not go line by line, but just trying to a bit explain to you what is happening in these different blocks of code. First, we are loading the data, set, both the fitting data set for parameterizing the model and the evaluation data set for checking the model. So this is the first step. And here we are using N97 material at 25 degrees. And for fitting the model, we are using symmetric triangular signals. This is a choice that has been done here. The model is fitted with symmetric triangular signal, 340 points. On here we have the frequency, the peak-to-peak -peak flux density, and the measured losses. On, for evaluating the data set, we have 2,400 points. On here we can have any kind of piecewise linear wave. So we have the frequency, this D on B matrix with this a piecewise linear description of the signal, and of course the losses that we will use at the end to compare how accurate are the predictions of the model. Once we have this data set, we are basically doing the main part, which is fitting, parameterizing the model. So what this function is doing is you give as an input this fitting data set, and you get as an output the model. This is basically what you are doing for doing the model. The first thing that you do, and this is optional, but I would really advise you to do it, is to have something to check the range. 
in which range you are providing the fitting data. So here, basically, this first function that it is doing is to take the point frequency and flux density of these signals that we use for parameterizing the model on check, return the functions that check are you inside or outside this range. So basically, what this is doing, this is looking at the range of the parameter you are providing, and then it can tell you are you inside or outside the range. And this is very useful because if you try to evaluate the model here, when you don't have any data, the model will give you something, but it will be extremely poor probably. So you have to be able to detect when you are developing the model, are you extrapolating or not? So this is something I would really advise you to do. Also, if you are doing machine learning is to be sure that you are not extrapolating or to detect when you are extrapolating. The second part is fitting the empirical parameters. For the IGSC in this example, this is fitting the parameter K, alpha, and beta. So here, basically, this is constructing the equation, the fit, which is saying K to F to the power of alpha, B to the power of beta, with this X vector containing um, K, alpha, and beta. Then looking at the relative error between the fit on the measurement on making a least square fit on obtaining the value of K, alpha, and beta. This is basically the fitting process. And here, this is a very simple fitting algorithm. You can use something more fancy, but this is getting the parameters. On no, we can also look at how good is this fit. So the error here is between minus 20 and 20% for this fit. These are the parameters, and these are the error metrics. Once we have this fit, we can really get the model, the IGSC, which basically will return the losses for a given frequency on a piecewise linear description of the waveform, sinusoidal, triangular, or anything. So here, this is the IGSC model, which is actually the core of the code implementing the model. So first, you extract the Steinmetz parameters. You are computing the derivative of the flux density, the DBDT that you need for the IGSC, the peak-to-peak -peak flux density that you also need, and then you are looking, are you in the range? Are this frequency on peak flux density that you are provided, are they compatible with the range of the data that you fit at the model? And this is basically this valid vector that will actually contain a flag. Is this point evaluated inside the fitting range or is it extrapolated? And then you are implementing the IGSC, which is B to the power of alpha, beta minus alpha on the DBDT to the power of alpha, and then the summation here is actually performing the IGSC integral. So the integral can be written as a sum summation. And now we have the model. We, if you return to the main script from the fitting data set, we got the model. Now we can use it with the evaluation data set on the model to look how good this model actually is. So basically what this is doing is, is Evaluating the model, getting the loss prediction on this flag, if the losses are valid or not, computing the error, and assigning the result to the output. Here, we can also get some metrics to look at the relative errors that we can see here. The histogram we get to minus 30 to 20% of losses. We have a 95 percentile error of 24%. And we can also see which point are valid. We have here, most of the points are valid. We have a few points that are extrapolated, which are so invalid, and we can basically look at here um, the error metrics. And at the end, we are going back to the main script. We are saving the result, and we are done. So just before I am opening some question, I want to give a few tips on programming. The first thing is don't underestimate um, development on debugging tools. You will need to write tools to be able to plot, display the different metrics, plot the result for a complete, for the complete data set, plot the result for a small part of the data set, just a sub range of it, plot the result for a single data point. If you don't have this code to do this plotting on display, it will be very difficult to check what is wrong with your model and improve it. Something else is, minimize the coupling between the 
part that is doing the model, the fitting and parameterization of the model on the evaluation of the model. Because this is how you use a model in real life. You first, someone is fitting the model, but then you are using it. You don't want to be dependent of what has been done to create the model. It should be as easy as possible to use. And this is also what you need for submitting the data for the magnet challenge, to have really a decoupling between creating the model and evaluating the model. So minimize the coupling and use clear interface between these two parts of this code. Something else to get the code relatively fast, because we have a lot of data in the magnet data set, is use vectorized instruction on no loop. Deal with vector or matrix. If you look at the code example I just showed you, there is not a single for loop. Everything is done by evaluating several points at the same time with vectors. You can also don't sampling or simplifying the wave shape. If you think that the data set that are provided, they have too many points, you can also decide at least when you are developing the code at the beginning to do some down sampling simplification of the wave shape. But also do not over optimize the code. The magnet challenge, it's a competition for developing magnetic material models. This is not a high performance computing computation. Don't go also completely overboard or trying to win microseconds at place where it doesn't really matter. On last, make the code easy to test on deploy because this is also some part of um, the things that will be judged at the end for the winner, but also like it will be very difficult for the judging committee to see how great your model is if it is packed in a code that is absolutely impossible to run, test, and actually see what is really happening. So this is for this talk. And here you have the link of the Magnet website, the repository of the Magnet, the repository that Professor Chen um, just mentioned about the Magnet challenge with all the information on here, last this repository with the IGSC on IGCC code that I just mentioned. So now I will be um, happy to open the discussion and um, mention on we can discuss and answer your different questions. I'm checking just the chat if there is. Also question, no, I think we don't have question directly in the chat, so you can just unmute yourself and um, ask if you have any kind of particular question for um, equation-based model or more generally about model. Yeah, thank you for your um, interesting presentation. Um, when you're going through the MATLAB example code, I found that you are using um, a duty cycle as an input to your model. Um, but I think the, the provided data set does not provide that. So is that more like the result of the beta, beta processing or? Yes, um, exactly. So here, this is the result of the data processing. You could also feed the complete input data because basically the data that are given with time on flux that is sample, they are piecewise linear waveform with, but with a lot of pieces. On this, you have to be careful do you want also to filter the data to avoid some of the measurement noise? So this is something that is in the processing that this is what um, I said, that this is very unlikely, but also if you do machine learning models that we cannot provide the data set in the form that each one of you will need for the different model, because each person, depending on the choice you are making, you will need a bit of a different format of the data set. So basically, you will have mostly to do some reorganization of the data set um, before you can use it in the form you want for the model. Um, this is probably the first thing that you will start with is select one material, maybe not start with all of them, maybe select one material, maybe I can advise you N20, um, N87 is a material that we used a lot for this example, so maybe start with this material on dig into the data set on look which kind of way from the R and get familiar with the, the, the data set I think is the first step that um, you should do before really starting to develop the models. 
Okay, okay. Was it N NH7? Yes, I think. I mean, you can select also other, but for example, I am mean, not sure when I said that, for example, the 3F4 material, which is an extremely high frequency material, might not be maybe the most representative material to start with the data set. So I would say N N87 might be a good choice um, to start with. But also then don't start to invest a lot, a lot of time in developing the model just for one material. At some point when the model start to work, start to check with the other um, material if the model is also performing well there or not. Okay, yeah, thank you. Do we have other questions? I saw a question that um, someone saying that is not registered in um, a team and it's possible to enter um, with a group. So I think if there is groups here, we said um, in the last webinar that we would be open to have team um, from more than one university. So if there are people um, that are um, looking for additional member in the team or so, you could actually um, decide to um, team up and make basically team together. Then if we don't have any um, further question, if you get um, more questions or more, uh, especially on this code example that I um, just um, gave you, you can always go and check um, on write us an email or the code is on GitHub. So you can also just open the discussion of the GitHub and ask, uh, ask for um, guidance and ask why this code is done like that. But also remember there is here not, there is never a single way or correct way of doing this thing. So it's all um, about you uh, that have to decide. I see another question in the um, chat about if recommendation for the temperature dependence in the analytical model. Um, this is effectively something which is not so easy um, because the different materials are very different temperature behavior because this is something when you are mixing the different compounds, the so nickel, the zinc, manganese, and so on for making ferrite, that you can select which kind of temperature behavior you want. So you have ferrite, a lot of, most of them will have the losses will decrease from the ambient temperature with the optimal losses around 90 degrees or so, but you also have other ferrite compounds that are specially made to have more temperature independent um, losses. So this is why it is not so easy to model the temperature behavior because this is not something universal across all materials. So you have to more like, typically all you are doing these things, you are like plotting um, the curve on looking, trying to look what is a common pattern for all the material for the frequency dependencies on where um, you should try to include that in the equations. But yeah, this is a bit always a problem. And this is why these things um, have until now not been done in a complete way is because they are not really easy. So temperature dependencies and relaxation losses are things that are not that easy to include. Otherwise, probably someone would have done it. Do we have um, still other questions on either on the chat or um, you want to just take the mic and ask a question? Okay, then otherwise, oh. Yes, I will share through, I can share the link in the chat for the MATLAB code. So 
this is here, this link on, oh, sorry, I somehow the chat was not sent to everyone. Uh, let's see. Everyone is a meeting. Okay. This is the link now to everyone. And yes, so the code is a bit more complete um, compared to the code that I just showed you on the slides because there is more comments on the code as is also a bit better structures. It's closer to what you, you would need um, for a, a more, for, for the magnet challenge. And also um, the code has some links to other repositories to kind of say, for example, for fitting the code, uh, for fitting the Steinmetz parameter. Here I'm using this very simple um, least square fit, but there is a link in the code to a more complete um, library if you want to do the fitting with, I don't know, genetic algorithm or, um, or better methods. So there is also in this code some pointers of some resources where you could actually uh, go for doing something more complex than this simple code that is provided. Okay, great. So thanks for Thomas for this uh, comprehensive introduction on the analytical models. And uh, it's uh, like a very good guidance for like how to implement this equation-based model. So uh, if you have any other problems um, uh, with uh, Thomas for this equation-based model, you can email us or just uh, post it so Professor Chen has already posted the link for the Magnet Challenge GitHub in the chat. You can check it out for that. And every update about the Magnet Challenge will be posted there. And you can also post your own questions regarding the registrations and any, any information on the challenge or any technical details. You can post it there and we are op open for, a, we offer an open discussion there. And also you can check out the repository that Thomas provides for the equation-based model to see the details of how the implementations and also the codes. And uh, finally, just as a reminder, next week, we're gonna have another example, uh, have another seminar for the examples of using neural network models for the equation-based model, uh, for the uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic model, like colors modeling. And uh, finally, so all the data for the 10 materials has already been public on the GitHub link, uh, GitHub repository. You can check out there and start to try out on your own ideas. And uh, I think that's all for today. Thanks everyone for attending.